And uh, one of the reasons is the faint sun paradox. Have you heard of that, John? I haven't. Okay, no problem. And first, nice to meet you. I'm a Likewise. light guy. We're two guys who disagree politely. Uh, the sun is dynamic. It is not static. The mass of the sun is changing, and the brightness of the sun is changing. The sun, faint sun paradox is, any, is something any old earth person should look up. The sun gets brighter every day as the core of the mass shrinks. As it gets brighter, it, it throws out more radiant energy. Even old earth people admit this is a big problem for them because only a few million years ago, the sun would have thrown out less energy and all the liquid water on earth would have been frozen. There would have been no life for that. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. So don't forget the sun is dynamic. The mass is changing of the sun every day, every second. That could throw out the orbits. The sun also produces uh, mutations in living things. Uh, John Sanford is a Cornell biochemist. He invented a gene gun. Nobody in the world knows more about plant genetics than John Sanford. He's a young earth creationist. He says the mutation rate in living organisms is so high, life could not have existed more than 50,000 years, perhaps 100,000 years. But um, old earth atheists uh, often think that life has been around for about three and a half million years. So the sun is one of my main reasons for believing the earth is young. And then there's erosion. If you were to lose one millionth of an inch per year from erosion, which is an extremely small amount, all the dinosaurs would have been exposed to erosion. Uh, the, the Earth is dynamic. The sun is dynamic. History only goes back 5,000 years. If you talk to a Chinese person, an Egyptian, a Vietnamese, Korean, Greek, they all say, we're the oldest civilization 5,000 years. And so history supports it. Science supports it. When you look at the dynamics of erosion, geology, and mutation in the sun, I believe it makes a lot more sense to believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. Let me give a minute to uh, John Kaminsky to respond. Uh, but, uh, I, I mean, we would have to make just drastic alterations to, to what we know about the laws of physics if you were to say that, that the cosmos could have come about in 6,000 years old. Uh, unless you're, uh, what, what I'm saying about stars, for example, is that for, for uh, a star to begin to, to even form gravitationally and then begin undergoing nuclear fusion, that process would take, I, I mean, it, it, it couldn't even conceivably occur in thousands of years. We have to be talking on the time scale of millions and billions of years. Bill Morgan, about 30 seconds to respond. Well, your hypothesis is driving you to your conclusion. If stars formed in the way you think they are, that's true. Uh, skeptics uh, believe that stars formed by hydrogen coming together by gravitational attraction. Well, if you compress the gra uh, gas uh, through gravity, it gets hotter, and Charles Laws teaches us it will no longer uh, compress. And secondly, my belief that hydrogen plus gravity equals thermonuclear fusion is the biggest free lunch I've ever heard of in science. Uh, I don't believe stars formed by gravitational attraction. All righty, we're going to call it there for this segment because uh, not enough time to get into uh, an update here. We're talking with Bill Morgan. He's online at fishdon'twalk.com, a creationist, and John Kabinsky, who is with us here from the University of Virginia, president of the Virginia Atheists and Agnostics, and uh, they have a website as well. I'm not sure if you have an easily accessible one to say on there, but you can direct us on how to find your website. Go ahead. Uh you you could just Google the group name, or it's just uh, Virginia Atheist uh, at Virginia.edu. Okay, terrific. We're heading into the break, and when we get back, we will have more interaction between the guests. It is a fascinating hour. Stay with us. You don't want to miss a moment of the Shilling Show. And we continue with the special edition of the Shilling Show. John Kaminsky is with us. He's the president of Virginia Atheists and Agnostics at uh, University of Virginia. Uh, Bill Morgan joins us, uh, proprietor of the website Fish Don't Walk, and uh, uh, somebody who has appeared on national programming on the topic of creation today. The topic is God or no God, and we're giving the guests opportunity to ask questions of each other and then to have a little interplay back and forth and follow up. And so, Bill, we're going to go right to you and allow you now to ask a question of John Kabinsky. So go right ahead. Thank you, Rob. Uh, John, could you please give me your number one, your strongest reason that you're an atheist, and please be specific and don't just say fields of science. Um, 
I'm convinced that there is no evidence uh, for the proposition. And, and really what I mean by that is that everything I see about the world and about my own life can be explained without postulating a god. It seems to me to be a superfluous assumption. Did you pick that up, Bill? Yes, I did. Uh, is he done? Yeah, okay. Okay, and then, then a follow-up. Well, as a biologist, uh, could you explain to me your best explanation uh, for the origin of life? I'm not asking you if you know how life originated, but the fact that the law of biogenesis and the cell theory teaches us scientifically life only comes from life in the natural world. How do you explain the origin of life? Of course, no one knows how life formed, including creationists, because it's, it is a very difficult problem. But it's just quite quite obviously, I think, within reason that organic chemistry could have come about under certain special conditions of the early Earth. And what I would say is, I, I would make an analogy, is one of my favorite Wikipedia articles is just a list of unsolved problems in science. And there's an unsolved problem in chemistry, which is that the way uh, that water achieves the kind of cohesion that it does isn't exactly well understood. But the question I would posit to you about, about this is, do you think that whatever the explanation ends up being for how water, you know, bonds the way that it does and achieves the cohesion that it does, is that explanation going to require magic? Is it going to be totally new? Or is it going to just be a rational explanation that's consistent with the body of knowledge we currently call chemistry? That's what I think about the origin of life. Whatever the answer is, I'm sure it's interesting, but I have no doubt that it's going to be consistent with the body of knowledge that we call chemistry and biology. Okay. Well, the water comment was a rabbit trail that I'm not going to go down. I asked him for his best explanation for the origin of life, and uh, he threw out the word organic chemistry, but I, I didn't hear any science. And is your answer based upon science or based upon your hypothesis? How did life originate? Could you give me an explanation? It's, it's, it's an assumption entailed by philosophical naturalism. I believe that everything that we see is a result of the laws of nature. And because the laws of nature are so effective at explaining everything else, I wouldn't expect the origin of life to be an exception to that. Then you agree life cannot come from non-life because that's what laws of nature and the cell theory teach us. That's what science tells us, John. I disagree. Uh, it's, it's clear that, well, it, it, essentially it must have happened unless you want to say that there was something else besides chemistry and physics that okay. are responsible for the phenomena. Okay, good. Uh, we're making progress. Uh, once again, your hypothesis is driving you to your conclusion. The foundation of science should be observation. Observations such as the law of biogenesis, the cell theory, everything is living came from something alive. The fleas on your dog, your dog, you came from life. Bacteria comes from life. All the body of evidence teaches us life only comes from life in the natural world. To hypothesize that life came from non-life is, as you said, philosophical and not scientific. Life is made up of non-living things. Your body right now, if we were to just separate all of the molecules that make up your body, they would also be non-living. So the question isn't whether life always has to beget life, but it, it's we already know is just how do you get the cor correct arrangement of non-living matter such that it begins to become what you want to call life? Because, of course, this is a somewhat arbitrary distinction. Well, this is a great point. I'm really glad you brought this up. John, politely, again, I'm not trying to one-up or anything. We're having a polite talk with people who disagree. What is the difference between a living dog and a dead dog? Merely I, the arrangement of atoms in okay, the dog. So, uh, I would disagree. I would say there's a dead dog that is completely the same biologically, physically, and chemistry as a living dog. Would you at least grant that? No. Well, what would be the difference between a dead dog and a living dog? That a, a, a live dog it has it's it has cellular relationships intact in such a way that it can, you know, under, undergo metabolic processing, etc. Okay. Well, I would say that the living dog and the dead dog could be 100% identical in their cellular arrangement, their biology, chemistry, and physics. 
I believe there's more to life than biology, chemistry, and physics. The difference between a, a living organism and a dead organism is beyond biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, and that would be the soul. The soul is the real John. When the soul leaves your body, John, your body could be the same biologically and chemistry, all the same sugars, lipids, proteins, but you're dead, that there's more to life than that. And that's why the law of biogenesis has never been falsified. You're not going to mix chemistry together and get a living organism. I'll give you 100 million dead dogs. Bring them to life. You've got all the biology, chemistry, and physics you need. They're going to remain dead. There's more to life than chemistry, biology, and physics. Let me go to the phones real quickly. We have just about a minute for Eva, and then we're going to come back with another question between the guests here. It's The Schilling Show, Bill Morgan and John Kabinsky, God or No God. Continuing this special edition of The Schilling Show, God or No God. Bill Morgan is with us, a creationist. He's online at fishdontwalk.com. And John Kabinsky joins us here from the University of Virginia and, uh, of course, he is with the group there, Virginia Atheists and Agnostics. You can just Google that, and you will be able to find the organization. We're continuing this format of questions back and forth between the guests, an opportunity for them to ask and then have responses to questions from the other. And so I believe if we go back to it here, I think it's John's turn to ask a question. So, John, go right ahead. Your next question for Bill Morgan. Okay, Bill. Uh well, in some ways, I'm beginning to doubt how productive it is for, for the audience for us to debate matters of, I guess, potentially obscure scientific direction. But 